Mini episode 1313 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode 1313. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here with good friend and fellow FDH Lounge dignitary and, and FDH NBA analyst Ben Chu. We are here breaking down. We've been doing a number of basketball talks recently on the show. It, it, it seemed like one has sort of fed into the other. It seems like just yesterday, in fact, it was late summer, we were talking about the resumption of the past NBA season. And then we were talking about the finals that were coming up. Uh, We did a finals recap. We looked ahead to the NBA draft very recently. We also did a nice little bonus segment, not tied to the calendar, just looking at the overall player development scene in the NBA right now and talked about a lot of the interesting aspects of it. I'd urge you all to go check that one out. That was a lot of fun to do. Here we are already. It's the beginning of December. We have coming up the beginning of the next NBA season. Not least of which because with the pandemic going on, they want to get it started early in case they run into any more complications along the way. And it seems like they will because this NBA season, at least as of the outset, isn't going to be in a bubble. It's going to be in the outside world. And we are seeing the bad COVID-19 spike that everybody had forecast for the fall. Everybody that was paying attention and was intellectually honest about it, that is. And the NFL is running into serious issues at the moment here. I mean... Any time you get Wednesday afternoon football from the NFL, that kind of tells you the general state of affairs. So that's the buzzsaw the NBA is flying into right about now as we start to look ahead to the 2020-2021 NBA season. Who can help break it down with better sense about what's happening than, as I said, aforementioned good friend and FDH NBA analyst Ben Chu. Ben, good to have you back on, my man, and uh, a lot of head scratchers as we look at this season coming up. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely going to be an interesting season. It's the shortest offseason of all time, which also means we'll probably have the shortest preseason of all time as well. You're right about that, and yet, uh, for eight teams, including my Cleveland Cavaliers, it's the longest offseason of all time, paradoxically, because when the league shut down in March... There were eight unfortunate teams that didn't make it into the bubble, didn't get to play any games, didn't get to have the developmental uh, situation here. That You look at a team like Phoenix that greatly benefited from it with with the exposure that their young players got, the playing time, everything like that inside the bubble. So for a team like the Lakers, for a team like the Heat, the teams that were in the finals, it's the shortest turnaround of all time. For the teams that were the dregs of the league last year, Ben, uh, paradoxically, they're going to be rusty as hell, uh, and they're going to be teams that are just raring to go, even if it's a little bit ugly at the outset, just because it's been so long for them. Right, and I think you know, the totality of how players perform, I, I think it's a little bit, I, I need to go against this, but I think a lot of players will be ready to go. The only concern I really have are some of the teams like the Lakers and the Heat, who played out the longest part of the bubble. Is their conditioning is going to have to be looked at by their team doctors and team officials. But I, I also like to think, too, Rick, is that we say the turnaround is so quick, but we keep also acting like a lot of these like super smart players are not going to get rest. A lot of players will not get rest to start the season. We, we always discuss in the NBA in prior years before the pandemic occurred that why are we playing such a long season and why are guys playing so much? pretty much meaningless game. So we're going to see this year with a 72 game schedule how the league looks and how player player health and player safety will be. Exactly. And I know that the league is going to continue to try to do everything they can to protect their nationally televised games. But outside of that, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of holier than now type behavior in terms of load management because again, for the teams that did play relatively deep into the autumn here, 
this is a turnaround that uh, it's just not realistic to expect a whole lot from them. We're looking at protocols with teams here that are going to be uh, coming into question. The NBA, of course, didn't do it this way. They had the bubble for the uh, end of the last season and the playoffs, and now it's going to be players in the outside world, just like in the NFL, where theoretically any guy suiting up on an NFL team could be getting coughed on by the same person in the grocery store as me or you. And so, too, will it now be uh, for the NBA. And, uh, again, for the teams that are really downtrodden again this year, for the teams that don't have a lot to play for, it will be very, very interesting to see. And I'm sure the league is going to be wagging a very firm disciplinary finger at them because the teams that might be a little bit more apathetic about this year, and, uh, again, the way it, it goes in the league, even – though the league has done its best to dissuade tanking in recent years. You have a very stacked lottery coming up next year, projected anyways. And so you have a number of teams that, uh, again, my Cavaliers among them, that don't have, I think, any illusions about making the playoffs this year and are just sort of along for the ride, want to develop the players, but no great sense of what's going to happen this year. You get into the dog days of the season, and that is, I think, what poses the biggest risk is when teams that aren't perhaps properly motivated to... uh, It's one thing when teams are undisciplined on court late in a season. We see it all the time. Everybody has got to be so disciplined off court all the way through this season if the NBA wants to make it through. And quite frankly, based on what we're seeing in the NFL and uh, some of the stupidity of some of the players thus far, the Denver Broncos quarterback room comes to mind. Uh, again, the notion that the NBA is going to make it all the way through when there are a number of teams out there that could be relatively unmotivated in terms of uh, best protocols, uh, it's very questionable to me that they're going to make it all the way through without another bubble. Uh, again, Rick, we've discussed this on camera. I'm less skeptical of this because the one definition or one, not the one definition, but the one specific thing I would say is different between the NBA and the NFL is the total of their traveling parties. With the NFL, we all know they're on average, at least 80 to 90, could be even more than that. And the league, especially with the NBA, I think the travel time between cities is going to obviously be taken down because they've been going to, for this season, experiment with the home and homes where a team will play in their own home market. The same, it's two, six, excuse me, I will get this correct. Two same teams will play in the same place over a series of three or four days, very similar to baseball. Right. Scheduling it. I'm not as skeptical only because I think the NFL, you have a lot more life time. I would make the argument, Rick, because you're playing every Sunday. It says you're always playing every Sunday. Guys are more likely to be a tad more lax than the end of the NBA when you're half constantly having to travel. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, so when you, when you, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to say that it's not impossible because we've seen it before where stuff has had to be canceled. I'm just very skeptical of it because I think the sense of belief that the NBA, even though they finish their season in a bubble, NBA players are a tad more in a bubble than, let's argue, uh, NFL players or baseball players. Interesting. Well, yeah, and let's hope it plays out like you're suggesting and that, uh, I, again, there will be problems. There, there, There's going to be yeah. along the way. Uh, let's hope they're manageable. The league also did a yeah. Right. They had 43 positives, yeah. just lead-wide, so that's not a great number, but yeah. statistically speaking, if you look at how many guys are on NBA rosters, it's not too bad. Well, yeah. It's not uh, great, but it's definitely not bad either. Right. And, uh, you know, again, they're, they're, they're going to be big problems throughout this season. The only thing you can hope for is that they're manageable. They Basically... That's the question of the season as far as the pandemic is. Is it going to be manageable? It was manageable to get through last year. This year is going to be a different format. Uh, We shall see on that. Uh, Again, uh, we're just going to look at this, I think, format-wise. Just kind of go do some notes division by division before getting to some sort of big picture stuff at the end as far as the better teams in the league. Starting with the Eastern Conference The uh, Atlantic Division, to me, it looks like it's going to come down to at the top, and I think a lot of people would probably guess this. You've got Boston that made the conference finals last year, a strong 
emerging season with their young talent. A lot of people feel like it could come down to them and Brooklyn, who this is the long-deferred debut of this uh, new era of the Nets as Kevin Durant uh, comes back from his uh, year out to join Kyrie Irving and the uh, the core of a Brooklyn uh, Nets team uh, that is uh, very talented. You've got them in there. You've got the Toronto Raptors, who uh, the, the, my sort of gloss on them right now, I guess they'll be the Tampa Bay Raptors in terms of where they're playing, but to, to me the Raptors are sort of the poor man's version of the, well, Raptors, because they did lose uh, Marc Gasol in the offseason. I almost said Pau Gasol. They lost Marc Gasol. They lost Serge Ibaka. They did get back for, uh, Fred Van Vliet uh, at a pretty good price, but they realized this was a guy that they were going to need. But uh, still have some holes in the front court that were caused by that. You've got a very intriguing situation in Philadelphia where a roster that didn't have nearly enough shooting power has become as much as it can be in one offseason, Daryl Morified. So you've got uh, Daryl Morey in there. You've got uh, Ty Lu. Uh, not Ty Lue, Doc Rivers. Uh, Freudian slip there as uh, Ty Lue gets uh, the old job in uh L.A. that uh, Doc was leaving behind, but uh, you look to see what Doc Rivers uh, and uh, Daryl Morey are going to be able to accomplish with this roster, with the tweaks made. The Knicks bringing up the rear, they're not really a very interesting story, I think, to anybody, Uh, although again, year one of Thibodeau, you start to see how the pieces are going to fit together there long term, but they're not a compelling story, I think, for this year, at least in a contention kind of a sense. They'll be a contender for one of the top slots in the lottery next year. So thoughts on an Atlantic division that, to me, looks like it's probably going to yield four playoff teams? Yeah, I mean, it's the first time we'll know for a long time, Rick, right, that the Atlantic, the Atlantic division is going to have probably three, maybe four playoff teams. Right. And it, it, it's very, a lot of these teams are going to be very interesting. I mean, we all know a Boston I mean, even young Tatum and Jalen Brown were able to get to a, get close to an NBA final. So the question I always have with the Celtics is that they have a lot of great players and a lot of talented wings. It just still really feels like, to me, the major question mark is going to be how Kemba Walker is going to play. Sure. He already, in the offseason, he had a uh, cell transplant, and it's going to be interesting to see how he holds up for this time. And so, but the one thing we always discuss off there is the Celtics, on a whole, are an incredibly talented team, but outside of Tatum and Brown, they don't really have a, third, a true third option. Right. And I think it's determined ultimately where Boston ends up at some point. Brooklyn's an interesting story because we'll get to see Kevin Durant play with Kyrie Irving and the whole team that they currently have, whether it might include James Target. It's, it's going to be interesting to see, but it's going to be really interesting to see how Kyrie maybe mesh together with some of the pieces like Kyrie Clover, Joe Harris, Jared Allen, DeAndre Jordan. So it's going to be really interested, interesting in Brooklyn. Obviously, you talked about Daryl Morey, so we'll talk about the 76ers. It's going to be interesting to see how Simmons and Embiid play together with more shooting. And how right. Tobias Harris is going to bounce back from a relatively, I would say, okay, but disappointing season. If we move to the Raptors in Tampa Bay, I mean, let's just be honest. They're going to be a they they might be on the downswing, but again, I know the front court holes you mentioned were there, but they did re- they did sign Aaron Baines in the offseason who played very well right. with and Chris Bush, and a guy who's been been off was part of their bench mob for the last year and a half, came up from their G League affiliate the Raptors nine hundred five. They're going to still be a very interesting team if Kyle Lowry and Pascal Siakam can continue to push forward and Van Vliet will be there. It's going to be interesting because the one thing I will say about the Raptors, defensively they are fantastic. So. Yes. And if I know anything about playoff basketball, they're going to continue to be good. And just to briefly touch on the next, it's going to be interesting to see how R.J. Barrett works. Yes. The Tom Thibodeau stuff offense. And if guys, some of their acquisitions, including their first round draft pick, Obi Top, and how they're going to just look. Because they got, and the one thing we have to know for their offseason, they got lost the rid of a lot of cap space. That's right. A ton of cap space. So they're going to be building for the future, but that future could be very, could be sooner than most people think. It, it could be, possibly, yeah. And, uh, again, just a few other notes there. I think for Toronto, yeah, the, the, the steps forward that Pascal Siakam can take, he made big strides last year. 
he's going to need to continue to make big strides uh, if they're going to move forward. And, uh, yeah, as, as far as it goes in Boston, uh, they had a third option in Gordon Hayward. I understand with him being a free agent uh, coming up, they weren't going to match that deal, nor should they have. And, again, he's a third wing as well. You can play guys out of position, of course, but in Boston, I, I really feel like one of the things that has sort of held them back a little bit is I think that Brad Stevens gets a little bit drunk on the line of positionless basketball. It's okay to have some scoring power outside of the wings here and there. Kemba Walker's probably going to be their de facto third option. But uh, positionless basketball has been coming to the NBA for years, but I think Boston overdoes it at times. Yeah, and I can understand that too because the question that a lot of us have early on, especially because if you remember prior to the pandemic, Boston did struggle. Right. And Tatum wasn't looking like this. Before the pandemic started, Boston was starting to come around and Tatum was getting hot. Yep. And they had a very good bubble. The question is, and the question that I think you have to ask is the team hierarchy is, again, very splendid on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And while they're great playoff performers, they haven't really closed the deal when it matters the most. That's right. They have to continue to take steps forward, no question about it. You get to the Central Division, and it's a lot less intriguing. In fact, I don't know if there's a less intriguing division in basketball because you have Milwaukee still clearly at the top of the pile uh, with a little bit of shuffle in the offseason here. Uh, enough to lock down the Greek freak. It doesn't seem so, at least for now, uh, especially with the Bogdanovic fiasco that happened. Uh, you've got Indiana a step behind them here, sort of a second tier of their own making a coaching change, but uh, again, having a very good roster and uh, a team that should make the playoffs based on the fact that, well, they get to play a lot of divisional games against the other three teams in the division, Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland. Chicago, with the surprise signing of Billy Donovan as head coach, uh, still an interesting young roster, but uh, interesting has been a synonym for disappointing in recent years with the lack of development. Outside of Zach Levine, you struggle to think who they've really strongly developed. Laurie Markkinen to an extent, but he seems to have plateaued. That's going to have to change if Chicago's going to make any bigger steps forward. They don't look like a playoff contender this year. Neither does Detroit, who is basically starting over uh, and with signing Grant away from uh, Denver, uh, he's going to be a key part of their foundation and probably end up uh, playing a bigger role than he should uh, on this team. Uh, it's, it's a team that seems to have learned nothing from some of the signings of the Joe Dumars era when you pay guys uh, to come in and, and play a bigger part in your system than they're basically cut out for doing. Uh, for the Cavaliers, again, I've been a little bit more high on uh, their prospects in the long term than have some people. Uh, Colin Sexton uh, developing pretty nicely, unsure if he'll ever be a true point guard, and that could be a problem at his size. Uh, Kevin Porter Jr., uh, if he stays out of trouble in the offseason, shows that that's an if. But uh, probably the most talented young player on this roster. How the pieces are going to fit together, you take a guy in a coro in the draft, overdrafted with the fifth spot, the guy still needs a jump shot. The front court's got plenty of veteran talent. Uh, with uh, Kevin Love, with Andre Drummond, with Larry Nance Jr., uh, but uh, at, the, at the four and five spots here. But uh, the, the Cavs are a model. They're not a playoff team this year. So you, you, you've got a Milwaukee team that is only going to be really pushed, Ben. I mean, they're one of the most interesting teams in the league. It's the last year that they hold the rights to uh, the Greek freak, and uh, I feel badly for them. They're reflecting back on the 2009-2010 Cavaliers season. That must be what it feels like to be a Bucks fan these days. Uh, but uh, they're, they're only going to get pushed, really, in a handful of regular season games outside the division, and then it's going to come down to the playoffs where they have grossly underachieved the last two seasons. Right, it's going to be interesting to see how they work in guys like Drew Holiday you know, and Brent Forbes. And it's going to be interesting to see with how Milwaukee and Mike Budenholzer adjust. And again, we've discussed this in prior pods, essentially, or episodes, that Milwaukee's ownership group hasn't exactly been very spendy, and this is where it could come back to bite them in the butt. And it's going, to, it's going to be interesting because we know Milwaukee's going to be good no matter what. The rest of the division is an absolute. Uh, I, I, want, I want to parse my words with this. It's literally, it looks like a girl that's far 
way that you think is very pretty, and they come up, and they're like, eh, I mean, it's all right. I mean, the Pacers, it's going to be interesting to see if, uh, if, if Nick Bjorkman, correct, if, they're, if the Raptors are assistant. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing Steve correctly. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, Nick Bjorkman. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. Victor Oladipo has been on the trading block for there. They got a lot of really good young pieces. You know, you still got Malcolm Brogdon. Uh, it would be most of us not to talk about bubble T.J. Warren, who had one of the better runs in the bubble. Right. But they also, and then it's going to be our to see some of their young big guys. That they might break them up between them on the bonus and uh, and uh, and Miles Turner. And just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed through the rest just to give us some more time to talk about the rest of these teams. I, I'm intrigued to see what happens in the Chicago and Detroit scenarios. This is for the first draft for Chicago GM Cabinas, and it's going to be really intriguing to see how Billy Donovan mesh mashes kind of that team because they really at times underperformed dramatically what they could do. Zach Levine also is on the block pretty much. It feels like almost everyone in the central has, it has no real truth. Everything is just sort of on the block entirely with them. Yep. I mean, Trace is beyond Detroit looks and Killian Hayes gets a lot of time to start. Right. But they're kind of a weird mishmash of a bunch of guys, and I'm not really expecting much from them. The Cavs are kind of the same way, too. It's a lot of mishmash. Of, it's a lot of, like, Middle Eastern, uh, not Middle Eastern, huh. Eastern Conference. <laughs> I got to correct myself there. Eastern. Chetty Osmond. I mean, it, Chetty it, Osmond, it, you it, were it, right. <laughs> I mean, I'll get it right. I'm Chetty like, Osmond's Middle Eastern. <laughs> Yep. There it is. Yeah. I mean, we know what it's going to be. Uh, again, listen, it, 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 although I've said this for other sports in the FDH lounge over a period of times, all things being equal, right? We're in a pandemic. I mean, God forbid right. one of the big stars on a team goes down from this and has a severe case of it, throw it all out the window. So I'm not trying to jinx Milwaukee, but, I mean, if Giannis ends up missing a good chunk of the season – then that's going to affect our, our outlook for them. But we have to say this, all things being equal, because it's pretty random right now. You don't know who's going to get hit by this thing or how hard it's going to be. So, again, all things being equal in looking at it. And uh, I, I, maybe this but again, is... again, I do want to note this for just to be of the uh, switch narrative. In terms of players recovering from the disease, especially in season, we haven't had a public case yet that was deemed to be incredibly terrible yet. Yes. And I remember saying... Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to note that just for the thing. Just for the, right. Just for the, well, for the people. And I said before sports restarted over the summer, I said that society is actually going to learn a decent amount about this in terms of how it goes. And you really haven't seen any players among the uh, the long haulers. Uh, I mean, you had uh, Rodriguez, the pitcher from the, the Red Sox that got the uh, swollen heart. Uh, so that's the one example of it there. Uh, Freddie Freeman of the Atlanta Braves got hit by it really hard at the beginning of the season and came back to become the MVP of the National League. So you're right. It, it, it is encouraging in looking at this, although, again, what it says for the rest of us is, uh, again, there's probably a correlation in between the better shape you're in going into this the better your odds of getting out of this thing relatively unscathed. I don't know that for Joe Bag of Donuts like the rest of us, if it's necessarily as encouraging, the fact that none of these guys stay down for the count very long. But you're right, it is worth noting, because we didn't know what was going to happen until the players came back. We knew a couple guys that had had it in the spring, like Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, whatever. I said when the bubble restarted, I said, I'm very curious to see what happens with these guys. Uh, Because I think in the case of, you know, yeah, do, there was one player that we did we kind of discussed, but we didn't really at the same time. Kendrick Dunn yes. dealt with COVID issues. That's why Torrin Dragic eventually got the start in the bubble. That's right. So we haven't had a high profile team yet of it in the NBA. Right. But I'm just leaning towards the odds that a professional athlete gets taken out by the disease for months on end. And yes. Yes. I that- would say less than. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Uh, there, there are some folks like Larry Nance Jr., who's got a little bit of an autoimmune issue there. I know right. he's been very cautious. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there are some players that because of other medical conditions have more at risk. But you're right, the average one, uh, again, good for them anyways. The average one is not at that much risk. Uh, having said that, uh, a little bit of uh, token but obligatory meanness on my part here. I'm going to single out Miles Turner for this one. I know that FDH Lounge dignitary John Adams always loves when I trot out the whole thing. You know, they, they say Brazil is the country of the future, and it always will be. I always like saying that certain players are the player of the future, and they always will be. Miles Turner looks like that guy to me. Like, I remember the hype that was on this guy a couple of years ago, and I mean, to the naked eye, he's still the same guy he was then. Like, I don't know if he's ever going to turn the corner. Uh, and I, I mean, he played exceptionally well at Orlando Summer League. He definitely showed they can. And again, he is still, if you look at what he's able to do on the court, he's the type of player that can spread the floor, block shots, and make threes at a high rate. Sure. The problem is that in the, the way Indiana plays him and the bonus together on the floor, I just don't really see that meshing well. Right. point there, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. You go to the southeast, uh, you have the surprise team of the NBA from last year, uh, the Miami Heat making it all the way to the NBA Finals, and uh, again, just a, a amazing coaching job by Eric Spolstra, excellent developmental job by he, by Pat Riley, in terms of identifying talent, getting the pieces to fit together here. This Miami core, they're not done yet. They saved uh, some, some cap room for 2021. They're going to make a run at Giannis. But whether they get him or they do something else, whatever they add to the piece, they will be an instant contender to win the championship, not just make the finals, but win the championship as the players continue to develop there and as they get that additional piece. They're still probably one piece away, as we saw in the finals, and probably will be throughout the course of the year unless they can swing a trade. My sense is from there, you're looking at two teams on the playoff bubble. I'm not sure that both of them are going to make it. Atlanta, particularly offensively, has made big strides in the offseason here. They're moving to more of a win-now kind of mode, which is interesting for a team that you thought was going to be building around Trey Young and to whatever extent John Collins, but moving to way more of a win-now mode. Washington getting rid of, I would say, the dead weight of John Wall and that contract, bringing in Russell Westbrook. Uh, that is a deal that uh, I think helps Washington's prospects. I don't know how Westbrook's going to gel with, with Bradley Beal, but he's bound to give you more than a John Wall who was mostly dependent on athleticism and is probably now going to be compromised post-Achilles tear. Charlotte's an interesting team with their young pieces. Uh, they got Gordon Hayward to come in, and, and probably they're going to be leaning on him for more than he's capable of doing at this point. If you're looking at him as being potentially the best player on your team, which he probably will be until Ball is able to kind of get the, the, his feet underneath him, then that's not much of a ceiling there. Orlando is actually a team that was in the playoffs last year, stole a game for Milwaukee in the, in the opener in the first round. But uh, Orlando kind of looks like they're in the wrong place at the wrong time because uh, Washington and I clearly took strides uh, in the offseason. Atlanta, big strides. Miami is still at the top. The Southeast uh, Division is, is going to be one that's going to have a lot of intrigue. And I think some of the most interesting games this year will be Atlanta versus Washington because there is the sense that those teams could be going head-to-head -head for a playoff spot here. So th that those those games will be a big part of the tiebreaker. Right, and I think the real question at that moment, Rick, is if you're looking at those two teams, that they, it's sort of a mirror image scenario in mm -hmm. terms of what are they ultimately going to be in the long run. And the Hawks, like you mentioned already, they started out, they were going super young, they are going with the, the triangle essentially Trey Young, Kevin Herter, and John Collins. And now you saw what they did in the offseason. They brought in Rayshon Rondo. They brought in Danilo Gallinari. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they're going to be just generally playing, just, you know, sort of moving forward. And I, I really do think, I mean, to go back to, well, I'll start at the top again with Miami. Bam got a 
extension in the offseason. And this is going to be his sort of make or break year. Yep. If he's going to be able to build off of what he was able to do in the playoffs and some of the big defensive plays he was able to make in the long run. Mm hmm. Kemba Walker, who ironically is still in Boston, which Gordon Hayward left behind. And, uh, yeah, the Southeast is an intriguing division, not just for this year, but for the years to come in the NBA. Uh, the Southwest Division, moving to the Western Conference, uh, I look at the standings from last year, and to me it's going to be kind of like an etch-a-sketch a little bit. Uh, you've, you've got Dallas that was in second place last year that is the, I think we can say, prohibitive favorites in the division at this point. And that's even with Porzingis being out in the early going here as he recovers from off-season surgery. Uh, Luca leveling up like a mofo last year right into the playoffs, too, uh, and uh, looking like a guy who was ready to uh, take the torch from LeBron uh, in the next year or two or three as the best player in the NBA. Uh, you've got Dallas, I think, clearly astride the division right now. Houston is in a real uh, state of flux, and I think that's being kind right now as uh, Fertitta takes them in a different direction. Maury is gone. D'Antoni is gone. Steven Silas is there, but doesn't quite know what he's going to have. As of the time you and I are recording this here, in the early days of December, James Harden is still on the roster. My guess is he's still on the roster at the beginning of the season because they have no incentive to just give him away. Uh, and it's these deals usually end up being four quarters for a dollar, and uh, Houston has no incentive to do that. But uh, I could see them getting lapped by uh, New Orleans, who looks like they're going to get ready to level up themselves after an eventful offseason. Uh, Stan Van Gundy will now be pacing the sidelines in the Big Easy. Memphis was right in the middle of the division last year. I see them right in about the same spot this year. John Morant had them up there uh, as a really, really uh, even better than respectable team, quicker than anybody thought, and uh, they're going to continue to make strides. San Antonio was a little bit further back, uh, a little further off the pace last year than we're used to seeing them, 
and I think that is probably going to be the new normal for them because they just don't have a lot of star power these days. You did see in the bubble some very intriguing things, and they tried, uh, I think DeMar DeRozan was at the four for some serious moments there, so... Uh, Greg Popovich, being the genius that he is, he's going to continue to get the most out of these guys. And maybe you've got the next Tony Parker or Mono Ginobili, Ginobili among them. I know they don't have the next uh, Duncan uh, anywhere in that core, but uh, if you even have a Parker or a Ginobili, I'd be a little bit kind of uh, squinting my eyes at the thought of that, a little suspicious. But uh, again, Popovich is going to make the most out of what he's got. The Southwest is always an interesting division, and it, it, we don't generally see one team strongly astride this division, just because you go back to how many years a combination of Houston, Dallas, San Antonio was kind of atop the mix here. But this looks like it's going to be a little bit different now, Ben, because I think the era of Dallas in this division is starting in earnest. Man, I mean, one thing, Rick, uh, I'll just come out and say it. I, they're my dark horse team to make the finals this year. Possibly. Okay. And it just becomes all the talent that they have around here. The big question will be if Chris Alportzinga can stay healthy. Yeah. But the one thing that I really respected about what Dallas did in the offseason was they went after the issues that they dealt with in that series against the Clippers, which yep. was linked defending. They got, Josh, they got Josh Green in the draft. They were able to retain Tim Hardaway Jr. They were able to retain guys, uh, guys like Dorian Finney-Smith. They also, I mean, they, they just seem like right now a very solid team. Luca, we, we discussed it so many times. I'm not going to waste my time even saying that Luca's incredible. He's going to be an MVP in the next two or three years, I guarantee it, barring injury. So they're going to be the class of this division for a long time. But again, there's going to be other teams like New Orleans. Zion's going to have a full season, hopefully, for them under their belt. They got Steven Adams from OKC. It's going to be interesting to see how they mismatch together. Eric Bledsoe, I know he was kind of given a lot of crap in, during his timeline in Milwaukee, but this might be a good new start for him. They got a lot of good pieces, right? Yep. And I think if they can mesh everything together, Brandon Ingram got his money, so they're going to be very good. And I still think, you know, they're going to, they, they still need to get there, and I think Sam Van Gundy is one of those coaches that I think in the annals of history have kind of been disrespected in a way, because he helped build that Miami team that ultimately got one to a title, and he helped build that Orlando team that went to the final. Yep. So they're going to be very, very interesting to be moving forward. And Memphis, I mean, their fortunes have completely 180 during this time. My job was, was definitely the rookie of the year last year, and they got a lot of good young pieces, guys like Brandon Clark. They were able to acquire a lot of guys through the draft who I think are going to be very big pieces for them. And it's going to be interesting to see what their status is going to be because I know Memphis and that entire region was hit very hard due to the coronavirus pandemic. If they might be the team that might be on the move to either Vegas or Seattle in the long term if Jaw and these Grizzlies do not falter in the short term. And I mean, just to briefly touch on San Antonio, they're a mismatch. We don't know what they're ultimately going to be. But they do have a lot of young talent. DeJounte Murray is still one of their good young pieces. Derek White played well. I expect them at some point to jettison guys like uh, DeMar DeRozan and Will Marcus Aldridge to other places. Right. But I always give a lot of credit to uh, to R.C. Buford and Popovich and Becky Hammond. That they'll figure something out. That they're going to at least be a competitive team that could steal a playoff spot. And to talk about Houston, I don't think we need to talk about them that much. So the thing that intrigues me the most at this point, Rick, is you're going to have John Wall with James Harden for a bit, and then John Wall's going to reunite with his former University of Kentucky teammate, DeMarcus Cousins, and they sign Christian Wood in the offseason. So I still think they're going to be very competitive. It's just, it feels like they're in the midst of like the rebuild of where they ship out their best player. But right. they still have a lot of very good talent at the same time. Exactly, and uh, I will say that uh, as far as it goes with San Antonio, uh, the the optimistic case out there for any Spurs fans, you you look at a former Spurs assistant from way back, Mike Brown, who ended up becoming head coach of the Cavs, believe it or not, on two different occasions, uh, and uh, my biggest criticism of him when he was Cavs coach, I mean, he, he's a guy who was hated by a good part of the fan base. A lot of people felt like the team won despite him. I was never as down on him as as was the average Cavs fan, 
but I always felt like his, one of his big liabilities was that uh, as far as team chemistry, team roles, I felt like he was horrible with that. And having that, you 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 could not look at this roster and 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 understand what was expected out of this guy, that guy, whatever. There was a lot of indecision about how the pieces fit together. I'll tell you this in San Antonio, that is not something that Greg Popovich suffers from. I agree with you that uh, I think that DeRozan and Aldridge will be on the move here, and that will allow him to get a greater clarity on these young players. And Ben, that's the one thing they won't suffer from, is lack of clarity about the roles. You're going to get to see them tried out and see who fails and who succeeds in these roles. There will be clarity in San Antonio about this roster going forward. Yeah, and I, I and again, we said this too. So last year was the last. I mean, it doesn't really feel like last year that San Antonio's playoff streak really ended because they went to the bubble. So I mean, it, it, it doesn't true. They're going to be very interesting moving forward. This is sort of the passing of the torch there. Every dynasty goes through this, Rick. We've seen it from like the '80s to go make the NFL, and now be the '80s 49ers. You know. The 90s Cowboys, we all see there's always a transition stage, and that's what San Antonio's currently in. And I mean, it's going to be kind of very similar for Dallas's ascension in this timeline. They got a lot of good young talent, and I hate, I'm going to say this now, I have to note this. I still think they got the steal in the draft in the second round in Tyrell Terry, a guy who played at Stanford who can shoot very high percentages from three and is athletic enough to get to the basket. Yeah. And the one thing that we, I personally feel why Dallas is going to continue to ascend as quickly as possible. If management down, they're absolutely, I would say, you've got the best triad of owner, GM, and coach at this timeline. Cuban is going to always spend money. Right. Don, Donnie Nelson is going to be always making the right decision for his team. And Rick Carlisle is a steady hand that makes great decisions in the playoffs. Yes, that is absolutely uh, the case. The, the only, uh, the last thing I would say on San Antonio, the only note of caution that I would offer, again, from my personal experiences as a fan, going back about five or six years, a very similar dynamic. The longest playoff streak in the NHL belonged to the Detroit Red Wings, and there was a determination, my, my favorite team, of course, a determination to keep that at all costs. And then the wheels just fell off completely once the team stopped making the playoffs. And uh, there is no, there there was no equivalent there at the time, shall we say, of either Popovich or of R.C. Buford. Steve Eiserman is now running things for the wing wheel. Uh, the, the the Red Wings are a year into the rebuild, and as a fan, I'm optimistic. But many rough years preceded that. Uh, having a genius coach and a genius general manager should cushion the fall somewhat for San Antonio. I'm sure their fans hope so. Anyways, uh, in the Northwest Division, uh, it should be very, very intriguing toward the top. I think most of us looking at the run that they had in the playoffs would slot Denver as the favorite in this division, but you can't say that Utah would be too far behind them because, uh, again, it was very, very uh, entertaining when they clashed last year and uh, how close it was between them as far as who was going to advance further uh, in the playoffs, uh, Denver and Utah atop the division, and uh, I agree with you about Dallas being a dark horse for the finals. I think for Denver, uh, I would also say that they are a dark horse as well. Uh, they didn't have the kind of off season where they were able to bring in uh, really any kind of talent to put them over the top. So Michael Porter Jr. in particular, his continued development is going to be critical. And I think it's fair to say at this point, because you've already seen a lot of growth from Jokic and Murray, and they'll continue to get better. But if you're looking at what offers them the biggest chance for the biggest advancement, as goes Michael Porter Jr., so go the Denver Nuggets this season, I would guess. Uh, Utah, again, as I said, right on their heels. Donovan Mitchell, one of the dominant players in the league. You saw it before most people, Ben. You said way back when you saw some Jordan-esque flashes from... Uh, Donovan Mitchell as a rookie, uh, you, you, you were putting him over before just about anybody I know, and you were right about that. Portland, a very intriguing mix there. They have been on the playoff periphery the last couple of years, advancing to the conference finals, actually, the season before last, but more so on the periphery of the playoffs. They look like they're going to be kind of in that position again, uh, but they've had an eventful offseason. 
Uh, Oklahoma City was in second place last year, tied for second with Utah. They won't be nearly as high after having their fire sale. And I believe Oklahoma City owns 50% of the draft picks in the NBA for the 2020s. So they're betting a lot on the future, shall we say, but the future is not now in OKC. And for Minnesota, you know, you add Anthony Edwards to the mix, it's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, but uh, they don't look like the kind of team that is going to be uh, set to take big steps forward this year. So to me, you've got Denver, Utah, and in all likelihood, Portland as playoff teams here. The other two teams just uh, hoping for years of growth, I would say. Right, and to just start off with Denver, I mean, they didn't really get supremely better, but two intriguing prospects. Uh, they got Composo from uh, Real Madrid, mm-hmm. who's a steady, I mean, I don't mean prospect in his case, he's 30 years old. Right. He's played every album ever, and now he's been, he'll be a steady hand on the section in terms of making great passes and great decisions. And RJ Hampton, they got in the first round of the NBA draft, a guy who was I was relatively high on before he dealt with his injury in, in the NBL. But Denver's going to be much better. Jamal Murray's going to have another season. Jokic is going to have another season under his belt of just doing what they do best. Utah, I, I'm, I feel a little bit more down on Utah than I should be because Donovan Mitchell had a fantastic bubble run and they were literally a shot away from preventing the Nuggets run from even happening. But they're gonna. it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of work together together with that team, they'll have Bogdanovich back. They're getting they got they reacquired their papers from uh the North with Pelicans. So they're 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 their front line power forwards and centers are gonna be definitely much better than in the prior season. So it's clear those those teams are gonna be perceived as the class. What was the most intriguing team I would say in the West outside of Dallas? Because they required Robert Covington in the offseason from Houston. Yep. The three and team win that they've been looking for for a long time. They keep a lot of the pieces that make them play well and get to the playoffs in the bubble. Carmel Anthony's coming back. Nurkic is going to get a full year. You know, Cantor comes over from Boston. He had hit some solid success with the Blazers as well. So I, I, I more team more down on Portland than I think, but I think that's a trap record. I think they're going to be better than people think it could be a team that ultimately gets to the Western Conference Finals just for what they're able to do. And then pretty much for the rest of the Western Conference, if I'm being honest, Minnesota, it's going to be interesting to see. We'll, we'll see if uh, Ryan Saunders, well, how they mix those pieces together. I mean, one guy I think with Minnesota is, is going to be interesting is how D'Angelo Russell and Carl Anthony Towns mesh together. They didn't get a lot of time. People tend to forget they literally had a month and a half together. So it's going to be interesting to see what they ultimately end up being and with OKC, I mean, I'll just laugh and see how supersonic. But I mean, the one thing that's going to be intriguing, Rick, is with all their draft prospects coming forward. The big question is going to be: Shaco just Alexander is going to be the heart of that team for yep. forward, and it's going to be interesting to see because the guy they probably want to be their star guard in the future will be Kate Cunningham. Right. And I don't know how those two are going to mesh in the long run. But the one thing you cannot say negatively about Sam Presti, their GM, is that he has acquired as many assets as humanly possible. And that's always good for any young, rebuilding team. But the question, and I've been wondering this for a while, is that you can acquire every draft asset in the world, but if it doesn't turn into anything, it truly doesn't matter. Right. That's true. Yeah, you gotta you got to make a count uh, for something here. And uh, with uh, Anthony Davis, who we'll be talking about in a moment, with him winning the championship, I think Carl Anthony Towns gets the torch the unfortunate torch as far as most uh, you know, underutilized uh, talent in the league as far as assets around him, the, the player most held back by his surroundings. Uh, again, they are somewhat... I mean, I do want to make one minor point record yeah. moving forward for Minnesota. They do have a very bright future, and I, I would not be shocked to see them jump into the playoffs. Yeah, it's possible. Because if Anthony Edwards lives up to the potential we all thought he was going to have, right. Outside of it's a, the great seed, you know, I would say I would say average year at Georgia. Right. They, still, they have a lot of talent on that team. People need to remember that in that trade with Denver that walked that brought them Malik Beasley and and Hernan Gomez. They have a lot of young talent on that team. People need to remember this that they were sort of the team everyone thought was going to get into the playoffs last year. Sure. So it sure. would not shock me if they do get in. It's just it might, this might be one year down. 
Chicago. Right, right. right. But just, just that much like Anthony Davis in New Orleans, it's been a crime against humanity that a great player like K.A.T. Uh, hasn't had a, uh, you know. Sorry about interrupting. Yeah, but yeah, no. Right. So there might be a bit more playmaking than they had last season. Yes, I'm sure they hope so anyways. Uh, Anthony Davis, we talked about here a second ago. He was one of two big additions uh, that the Lakers made in the last two years that got them their championship. Uh, the other one's a guy you might have heard of, LeBron James, uh, who has been there two years now. Uh, the Lakers winning the title. This looked like, ultimately, when you, when you look at... Uh, uh, Golden State uh, taking a knee for last year with their injuries with, between the Lakers, between the Clippers, who underachieved in the playoffs the way that they usually do, notwithstanding having Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, and, and that made it certainly more surprising to see them choke the way that they did. But uh, nevertheless, a very talented team. Ty Lue, now the head coach, uh, he is a championship coach. Of course, going back to my 2016 Cavs, it was looking like Lakers, Clippers, Golden State, like it would be a three-way dance atop the division here, a great three-way rivalry. Clay Thompson goes down, uh, this time with an Achilles. So medium to long term, you wonder if he'll ever be the same coming off of these things consecutively. But for this year, it takes Golden State, I would guess, right out of the playoff picture in a very competitive Western Conference, not least of which because the team in the Pacific Division that looks poised to pick up the slack there is Phoenix, uh, which is the one team that had an incredible bubble run. By the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't put over from the previous division we talked about here in Portland. Uh, let me be completely self-serving and talk about Shaq of the Mac Jr., Gary Trent Jr., uh, son of the Ohio Bobcat legend who had a great bubble run here, uh, as did uh, Phoenix, the young talent. Uh, they played so well. They had an amazing run in Orlando, and it uh, looks like it's going to carry forward with the acquisition of Chris Paul. You get him in there. Uh, again, standout play at point guard uh, is something they really, really needed. Uh, and, and They had playmaking with Rubio, but this gives them the scoring to go along with it, which you have to have in today's NBA Sacramento remains a very interesting franchise here and uh, has decent young talent uh, in, in the backcourt uh, and, uh, again, uh, could be running a three-guard offense a lot from what we saw in, in the offseason here, getting uh, Halliburton in the draft to go along with uh, Fox and Heald in that backcourt. Uh, but, uh, again, the Lakers just uh, had, had an off season that really kind of sets them apart. Uh, Montrez Harrell coming across the, uh, the, the the building here from the Clippers uh, in the off season. You get Dennis Schrader uh, in there at the point, and uh, the Lakers look to have kind of upgraded. So you and I have been talking about that the league appears to be heading into a period of parity in the 2020s. Not so much parity as in any team can win the title, but a hierarchy of like six to eight teams out of which conceivably any one of those teams could do it. I think that future remains a year down the road at least at this point in time because the Lakers, to me, look stronger than they did when they were hoisting the trophy. They, to me, are the favorite at this point and the team to beat till somebody takes it away from them. No, I, I think that's, I don't think I need to say anything more than that. We also have to mention they did acquire Gasol from uh, the Toronto Raptors. That's right. And they, they got much, you know, they got, the argument was that the one thing you would say about the rap, not the rap, but the Lakers in this playoff, the bubble playoff run, they were a much older team, and now they've got significantly younger. Yes. Schroeder's going to be a great player. To, he, he was kind of forewarned in OKC and during his time on the Atlanta Hawks, but I think he's one of the better point guards out there right now. And to essentially, with LeBron walking in for two years at $85 million with Anthony David signing his max, Rob Polinka is probably in the best of both worlds right now. But he has his two superstars locked in now, and they got a lot of young talent. They got a lot of young talent surrounding him. And it's going to be interesting to see how they sort of mesh together during the season. But the Lakers are clearly the class of the division and probably should repeat, barring any sort of injury or absolute zaniness moving forward. If we move to, uh, to the Phoenix Suns, who are probably the most intriguing team of the offseason. Chris Paul is going to be very interesting to see with that team because Ricky Rubio was a pure distributor and Paul has, his, has a much better scoring ability. And it's going to be interesting to see what they kind of figure out or what they're going to 
going to end up doing because I assume a lot of high tempo offense with uh, Monty Williams as their head coach. And with Devin Booker, Cameron Johnson, DeAndre Dean, they're going to have a very good, solid team. The question that I always wonder is Chris Paul is coming in. Chris Paul tends to put a stamp on every team he is. The only thing I'm concerned with is that if that stamp rubs Devin Booker the wrong way, right. that they might have a culture two at some point if that team is not winning. Right. Yeah, so I can it, see it coming out uh, of that. I, 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 I love Chris Paul as a player, but I always, again, wonder how impactful Chris Paul is if he still has not made a conference final. That's an excellent point. And, again, uh, a lot of city miles on him at this point, too. So... That that's always something to and, pay and attention. And also to touch on another thing that with Phoenix too is that they had a great run in the bubble playoff, and I kind of, as a fan, wanted to see them at full blast the following season. Now I don't think the deal was bad for them because they didn't really give up anything in return. Right. But that does overly concern me that if they don't match well together, that team is not going to get into the playoffs. And right. I mean, if, and again, I'm a little bit different in terms of Golden State. I'm counting them out for now, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do make it. Steph, and Steph Curry is still Steph Curry. Draymond Green is still Draymond Green. The big X factor for them is how James Wiseman acclimates himself to the NBA game. Because if he can come in with all that promise and all that talent, he was that he essentially was going to be being the number one overall pick. He has a very good chance of playing very well in Golden State, and they their team is still going to be very good. I don't right. think anyone's going to deny that. The Clippers, it almost feels like the Clippers' loss is going to hurt them more than anything else. They just seem like that they were well on their way for the Western Conference, the LA LA battle that everyone had predicted. Pretty much, I think 99.9 percent of people outside of you and me were outside of me, actually. I'm, right. I'm putting, putting myself over again, Rick Moore. Yeah. I think I, I'm one of the few people that questioned if that was going to happen or not. I said but, LA LA. I said it. Yeah. And like I said, we both questioned it. I don't think anyone. I think the traditional media did it. Right. The question I will note, though, too, is that with the Clippers going forward, they lost Harrell. There's discussion they want to trade Lou Williams. The question I really have is what's that bench unit going to look like moving forward if both of them are gone? Right. And with Paul George not fully buying all in, I really don't know what the Clippers are going to be. They they, they are essentially in the win-now mode of all win-now mode. Rick. I've never seen that before with any team after acquiring the assets they had to what they are now. Right. And I will briefly touch on Sacramento as well. Hal Vernon is the most interesting player in this draft. He's either going to be a a uh, five-tool guy that does nothing particularly well or a guy that can just essentially build around up a franchise. Now, let, let's be honest, too. They made a mistake with taking Doncic over Bagley. Yeah. With, excuse me, with Bagley over Doncic. But the argument I would make is that if Bagley can get to some level of help with Hal Vernon and with the Aaron Fox. I think they're going to be a very interesting team moving forward. I really, truly do. They got Hassan Whiteside from Portland in the offseason, so he'll be able to anchor their, their the center position for them, which, they, to be honest, if I'm being honest, they haven't really had a guy this one season right. to really to anchor that area. And on top of that, it's going to be interesting to see some of their younger talent sort of shine through in terms of, you know, what they could do. Because again, they, they feel like it wants to be like Minnesota, Rick, that they have all this young talent that you would have think by the fall, at some point they jump and steal a playoff spot. Right. And it, it wouldn't surprise, I think, either one of us if, if they did, because they have enough talent uh, for that. As far as it goes here, uh, big picture for the season, I'll say in the Eastern Conference that Boston again makes it to the Eastern Conference Finals, but this time I'll have Brooklyn getting past them in the West. I will say Lakers in, let's say, seven over Dallas. I think it's going to be an epic between LeBron and Luka, and I think we get close to the passing of the torch there, but not quite. And I will say Lakers over Nets in the Finals. Uh, It'll be more interesting than the last time that these teams played in the Finals almost 20 years ago because there was... uh, uh, there was, among other things, not the intrigue of uh, LeBron v. Kyrie, which will certainly add a lot of sizzle to it. But uh, for LeBron, the chance to get past uh, the one big boogeyman still in his career, which is Kevin Durant, 
uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, the Golden State team was impregnable once uh, Durant got there, uh, and he, he held them back from uh, being able to win titles those last two years there. So I'll say Lakers over uh, Nets in the finals. Do you have any kind of sense of uh, what we might be looking at at the end? Uh, and again, this is very initial. I feel like every time I do these, I always say very initial. Last year, Philadelphia to beat the for the finals. And That's that right. Really and Denver, I think. Uh, you were, I yeah. Right. Absolutely. I think the one that didn't work out and one that did. <laughs> but I, I'm going to say, too, is that I, uh, this feels like a year for Brooklyn to make it, but I think they don't. I think we might see the rematch that we've all been. Uh, the NBA has been waiting for this forever, Rick. It, it's been nearly a decade, but it's coming back. I, I perceive in the Eastern Conference. Boston and Brooklyn. I think Boston finally gets over their hump, proverbial hump. Okay. And makes it to the finals in the Western Conference. People are going to say I'm crazy when I say this, but I think we're on a path for something I've never, I, I don't think I've ever really conceived this, but I'm going to say it. I think we're, we're looking at the wrong superstar this year. I think this is the year that the New Orleans Pelicans make it to the Western Conference final. Okay. I'm crazy. I want to put it out there, Dave Van Gundy has worked miracles before. Right. So I think the Pelicans are going to make it just to continue that entire sort of loop we're in. Okay. That they'll face Anthony Davis. Obviously, I'm not going to be too crazy where I can say the Lakers, I think, barring injury, are clearly the best team. So we'll see an L.A. Boston rematch. It's, it's about 10 years, so we're giving this again. Yeah. So. Well, the, the league would love that. They'd love it even more, I think, if Kyrie was still in Boston because it'd be one more subtext. Uh, but uh, even with the players... I, I do want to note this too, Rick. I do note this out of proverbial narrative. I think Dallas is my dark horse team, but my real concern is for making them help. Yes. That prevents me protecting them out that far. Yes, I can understand that. And uh, again, I think both, neither one of us would be surprised uh, if Denver was in at least the conference finals and, again. And I, I, I just feel, too, that they're off of Jeremy Grant in two days. I really do. It's going to be tough. Yeah, it's going to be tough for them to uh, make that replacement there uh, this year. So this might not be the year that they make another step forward. It'd be hard to. And again, because... like I said, I, Matt, Brad, not too Matt, Rick, and I'm clearly, I'm clearly crazy in this scenario. I am projecting the Pelicans ahead of schedule. But Brandon Ingram did play super well last year. They got definitely better in the offseason. Right. Again, uh, crazier things have happened, Rick. We saw a global pandemic happen. I do not see a scenario where Zion in the second round is not possible. And the one thing I do think that they improved on with the acquisition of Stephen Adams, mm -hmm. they're much tougher defensively than they were last season. Right. That's true. Like, yeah. as much as I was there in favor as a player, he's a rotating door on the event. Right, right. Yeah, they, they, they definitely got tougher in the uh, front court. In the off season, no question about it. Well, it will be fascinating to see how this plays out, uh, Ben Chu. Uh, we'll be talking about this uh, subsequently here on and off air as the uh, league season goes on. Uh, last season was one like none other. This one, which will start in the same pandemic. And uh, God willing, it'll be a much different year by the end of the season. But something tells me it won't be a, a completely different world. Uh, we'll, we'll still at least be dealing with pandemic residue all the way through the season. So we'll see how it plays out. I appreciate your time greatly, Ben Chu. Thank you so much, my friend. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge Mini, Episode 1313.